Tonight we want to take a look at uh, the book of Proverbs, and in doing that, the 31 chapters of the book of Proverbs is really a misnomer. It's not a book, it's a collection. And it's actually a collection that comes in seven sections, as best we can tell, based on the authorship of those sections. So I put a little chart behind me that'll, that I'll walk you through as we're doing that. This one hour, one book will be different than others. I'm not going to take you systematically through 31 chapters of uh, Proverbs because it would be essentially like reading a thousand fortune cookies. It would be very, very difficult for you to get out of it any kind of cohesion because of the way the book is written. It is actually designed as a collection. So what I want to do is take a little time to go through where this fits in the uh, wisdom literature, then look at the book and how it's laid out. Then I'm going to do a sample of how to study the book so that you'll have some idea of what to do. For students, you will actually be required to color code according to a series of um, uh, groupings of the, let's say, groupings of the fortune cookies, if you will. But they're actually, it's an, the only intelligent way I can find to study the book is to actually group together all the things that are like-minded, and the way I do it is by color coding. So, Proverbs belongs to a collection, and the collection itself is part of the wisdom literature. There are actually six books that are considered wisdom literature in the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, wisdom literature actually, it comes from as far back as the time of the patriarchs, and you'll notice that Job is in that collection, coming back from as far as 18 or 1900 BCE, and as late as 586 and the fall of the temple. All the way up through that time period, there are um, these six collections are being put together. They're divided into two kinds of wisdom literature. The top ones are essentially what we would call didactic literature. That means teaching. Didactic is a word for these are designed to teach you something. Not that these don't teach you anything, but that they are designed for devotional purposes. So these are didactic, these are devotional. Let me just go through each one so that we have some appreciation. Proverbs is the word mishle in Hebrew. Mashal is like a parable. Mishle is like, think of the Proverbs as a quilt. Each square of the quilt actually was a cloth that was by itself, but they were stitched together into one very large blanket. So the 31 chapters of the Proverbs are a series of small squares, all that stand by themselves on a given text, on a given uh, subject. So for instance, if, um, if the writer wants to tell you about uh, wisdom, he can make little pithy statements that by themselves are many sermons, each of those squares, and then put them together in Proverbs in a big blanket. The purpose of the teaching is that there is a key to understanding life. Proverbs puts forward the idea there is a key to understanding life. Without that key, you will not understand life. And the key is you must understand that life only makes sense when the fear of the Lord, the reverence of God, is beneath the entire idea. If everything in life starts and ends with God's purpose, God's reverence, fear of God, that's how you can begin to understand the world, and the world was set by Him. In other words, everything is for what God says it's for. Its definition and its purpose is found in Him and Him alone. There is no other voice in heaven determining what things are other than God. Let me say it another way. God wrote the only dictionary that counts. What he says it is, is what it is. What a preponderance of people in lab coats say it is, has nothing to do with that. When God speaks, all others are silent. So Proverbs was designed to give you primarily the fruits of righteousness and unrighteousness built on the reverence of God. And it teaches you what life is about. Now, think of Proverbs as truisms. Some years ago, I had a dog, and my dog would normally eat at a specific time in a specific place from a specific bowl. I could give you, if you were going to watch my dog and dog sit while I was away, exactly what that was like. I could say, this is when Chloe eats, this is what Chloe does. 
But when I went away, she never did exactly what she did when I was there. So she would get sad and she would mope and she wouldn't eat and all kinds of things would happen. The truism is to tell you how it was designed. This is the norm. What happens can be something else. So what did I just say? Proverbs are not, are not, are not promises. They're how things were meant to be, but you cannot look at them as promises. Therefore, if you read, train up a child according to his bend, and when he's old, he will not depart from it, is not a promise. It's the standard by which things were intended to go. There are other factors in what a child turns out to be. Let me say that there's another didactic book, the uh, book of Ecclesiastes. This one in Hebrew is Kohelet. Kohelet, Kahal is the word for assemble or announcer. And Kohelet is um, the idea of an assembly or the words of the preacher or the announcer to the assembly. And Kohelet says essentially this. Life under the sun doesn't make sense. It's not fair. It's absurd because the answer isn't under the sun, it's beyond the sun. If you try to put life in the here and now, this is the answer to the secularist in the university today. It's not going to make sense apart from God, because that's where the answer is. Origin, purpose, and destiny are found in Him. They're not found under the sun. So the physical, material world will only take you so far. Then you won't understand what it's about. And Kohelet, or Ecclesiastes, is trying to show you that the way to truth is to leave beyond the sun and go and be where God is, and then you'll understand. Now, the third one, uh, students, you've actually been uh, diving into this one and are currently in it in your day classes. Uh, Job is essentially God's right to direct my life. When we read about Job, we, we often talk about it in terms of the crucible of testing and whether or not uh, uh, trials are in your life and what are the place of trials in your life. But I think there's really something more fo foundational. Job is about, does God have the right to s sign off on things coming into my life, whether they come indirectly by way of Satan or not, doesn't make any difference to me. When I am flying and the, and the airplane's going like this, I don't care whether it's the wind currents. You can tell me why I don't care. I'm scared. When my boat is rocking like this and I think I'm going down, don't start telling me about barometric pressure. I don't care. Here's what I can tell you. I can tell you that Job is really about whether God directly does it or indirectly does it, does God have the right to use my life in a way that I don't like, I don't want, I don't understand? And the answer is clearly yes, for his purposes, because that's what I was created for. So those are to teach me. Now, when you get down to the Psalms, these are devotional. What is the Nature of worship. How does worship draw me into God's presence? To, the word tehelim is the Hebrew for Psalms. And it literally is, it's the um, worship and its work in my life. The range of praise. And by the way, there are many words in Hebrew for praise. There are six that are popular. I mean, one form of praise is yada. And it, and, and it is literally physical praise. God didn't intend us only to praise by sitting and opening hymn books and singing songs. There's a lot of other things. That's why he had uh, loud playing drums that were part of worship. The praise has many forms, but in the Psalms, what we have is not the music, but the words. And how do they draw me in? Functional reverence. That's what I would call Psalms. Functional reverence. How does reverence look in my life? What does it look like? And then there's another, um, another book, Shira Shirim, or the Song of Songs, sometimes called the Song of Solomon. And this one's a little bit tough. Honestly, when you open up Song of Solomon, it's a very earthy, very sensual, very physically oriented book. For a number of years teaching uh, GCBI, I was actually hesitant to teach it to young people because none of them were married, and it was just a weird thing to do. Here's what, I, here, here's what I see. Your time here in the body is not irrelevant. In other words, God gave you the ability to eat, but he also gave you a tongue so you can taste. It's relevant. For, for centuries, the Church of Jesus Christ 
sort of told the story in the Middle Ages like this. Life is hard, you grit it out, then you break through the veil, and then you're in heaven. That's not really biblical. That sort of denies the fact that God gave you taste buds. The design of life is that uh, uh, Adam was created to walk with God and hold his hand in the garden and let, it, and let God lead him. That was severed in the fall. But in Christ, I can have that relationship with him now, and, and he can lead me right now. In other words, you don't have to wait for heaven to have the blessing of walking with God. You can have that right now. And then when you graduate into heaven, it's just a better form of that. So here's the thing. This very affectionate, earth-love-oriented dialogue of Shira Shirim, or Song of Songs, shows that my walk here, my life here, my experiences here, love, here is an intended part of my experience. God doesn't just want you to be a Christian, eat the very toughest thing, sleep on a bed of nails and just grit it out because you're a believer and you shouldn't be having any fun. No, because this is a narrative that's very beautiful, very fun, very light, very, um, very much about relationship in the here and now. Okay, there's one more, Echa. Echa is the word for... Uh, lamentations, and it's, uh, it's an onomatopoeia. It's like, echa, like, ay, you know. And it's, uh, it's a word that basically is, you have to appreciate, there are five lamentations as um, Jeremiah is sitting on uh, the hillside of the Mount of Olives watching Jerusalem come apart. And really, the whole theme of the lamentations, these are five, I wouldn't even call them hot hits because this would definitely be the blues section, okay? But the idea was more like this. Judgment isn't the end. God's not done. Let me say it another way. You can't measure how it's going to come out by what it looks like today. That's the theme of Lamentations. Today might be terrible, but you can't measure anything today. Because, you know, to a wounded soldier, you're never going to... You never get an accurate report from a wounded soldier. They're, you're going to get a, a worse report than what is. So, let's take a look at the one that we want to study for this presentation, and that is um, the Proverbs. It's actually, in, if you read Proverbs 1.1, it says the Proverbs of Solomon, Mishle Shlomo, and it's also called the same thing in the Septuagint version. Proverbs pulls together about 513 of the 3,000 Proverbs originally pondered by Solomon. You got to understand, he was not only wise, he had time on his hands. When you're king, you can do stuff other people can't do. They're out there working the farm. You're sitting there making up pithy sayings. So according to 1 Kings chapter 4, and I put that in the front sheet of Proverbs in your Bible, 1 Kings 4.32, 1 Kings 4.32, and Ecclesiastes 12.9. 1 Kings 4.32, Ecclesiastes 12.9. These are the, it says that Solomon actually pondered 3,000 of these things and Later on, Hezekiah's men had the decency to cut them down because some of them were repetitive because Solomon got wordy. And so we're, we're appreciative of that because sometimes pastors get really long-winded. Anyway, the English term proverb is actually the word to be like. So they're comparatives, they're concrete images, and they teach life's most profound truths. Proverbs are supposed to be simple moral statements or illustrations that highlight and teach fundamental realities about life. So Solomon sought God's wisdom, and uh, you see that in the beginning of 2 Chronicles, and he offered pithy sayings to help people contemplate truth. That's why I call them fortune cookies. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to demean the scripture. I'm just trying to say, you read it and it kind of, you go, hmm, and it's supposed to help you to ponder or contemplate truth. Now, in its current state, the 31 chapters as you have them didn't get that state until 1,500 years after Jesus. The original uh, collections of Proverbs are probably in these seven sets, more or less. Some people break the last one, and I'll tell you why, but the, it's very difficult for me to say. It looks to me like the final form snapped on verses 1 through 7 of chapter 1 and snapped on the last part of chapter 31 and gave you sort of a prologue and an epilogue and this became sort of dialogues with wise people and Solomon sitting there giving you dialogues. Clearly, most of them come from people who either knew Solomon or were like influenced by Solomon. 
some of them were cut down of Solomon, and sometimes it's still repetitive with 513 of them left. Chapters 1 through 9 are almost all considered Solomonic. That is, they're probably cut down by Hezekiah's men in terms of the, their wordiness, but um, there's initially an invitation to young men on a course on wisdom, and then there's 10 instructions, or what I would call intuitive poems, of a woman who personifies wisdom. And so in the very beginning, that'll offer you the first block, that's Solomonic. The second block between chapter 10 and chapter 22, verse 16, is the longest block. This is not to scale. This would by far be the longest block. And again, it's considered to be Proverbs of Solomon because it says it's Proverbs of Solomon. There are 375 Proverbs in that section. It's a huge section. And basically, they're cut into, uh, cut into a couple of parts. One of the parts is that it's a contrast of a wise man and a fool. Sometimes it's the, the righteous man and the wicked man. And sometimes it's counsel on wisdom and foolishness. How to know if you're being wise, how to know if that's going to leave a mark before you try. That kind of thing. In the section of this long section, Proverbs 10 through 15 always has um, pretty much 10 through 15. The first part of this is constructed in two line long Proverbs. It's a series of two lines, two lines, two lines, two lines from chapters 10 to 15. And that takes up the bulk of this. And essentially, they almost always express a contrast. Now, when you get to the next two sections, section three and section four, chapter 22 through partway through, halfway through 22 through halfway through 24, these are called, if you look at it, the sayings of the wise. And scholars note that there's 30 sayings of the wise in this section that roughly match the Egyptian wisdom from the same time period. In other words, it looks like we got a copy of some of the things Solomon was saying that showed up in Egypt at the same time. From, from my standpoint, the sayings of the wise appear to be early wisdom, meaning Solomonic. And I'll tell you why. When you get to 24, chapter 24, verse 23, it says, these are also the sayings of the wise. But what's different between them is the language reflects that probably these came later. The early ones are probably Solomonic. The later ones are probably from the time of Hezekiah, which is right around 720 BCE. It's later than the time of, uh, it's 210 years later than Solomon's, okay, if that helps. Now, Proverbs uh, 25 to 29 is by the whole school of Hezekiah. And you should take some amount of comfort in the fact that in 1 Kings 4, we know that there actually was a larger number and in, uh, a little bit later on, uh, Hezekiah's men in, in uh, 1 Kings 25, it says they literally went in and they worked on the manuscripts and got you what you have. So there's a process for you getting the Bible the way you have it now. It's not just like God said, right, and the guy started writing chapter 1, verse 1. It doesn't work like that. Okay, you've gone through several iterations to get it to where you have it now. As I said to you in class the other day, to me, the issue isn't, do I know who wrote this down? The issue is, do I know who the author is? For me, the line is, it's Holy Spirit authored, regardless of which guy wrote it down. Because sometimes, we, don't, we go to Hebrews, we don't even know who wrote it. It doesn't matter, because we know who the author is, that's the Holy Spirit. So when you, when you understand the collection of Scripture to be God-breathed and profitable, it's no longer about whether Solomon wrote it down or Hezekiah wrote it down. What difference does it make to you? They're both dead and dust by now anyway. Um, and neither of them still has a valid copyright, so you can copy it down at will. The, the point is that Hezekiah's men are between 720 B.C. and down to about, oh, 685 B.C. And um, a lot of the Proverbs have a common feature. They use figurative language. So if you're familiar with reading the Proverbs, you'll see language like, like cold water to a weary soul is good news from a distant land. And Proverbs 25 alone has 11 times the word like or as. So it's comparatives. You're supposed to be comparing back and forth. 
Okay, we know that the book contains a short prologue from 1, 1 to 7 at the very beginning of the book. And that sort of lays out the case. And then we know also that in 31, 10 through, I think it's 31 was the last verse in there, I think it's 31, is, um, is actually the epilogue. And the body of the literature then comes in these sections. You'll notice that in 30, there's a fellow by the name of Agor, and you don't know much about him, but he produces uh, uh, some proverbs about creation and divine power and human ignorance. And then you see that there's also more that's about Lemuel, Lemuel, uh, King Lemuel of Massa, which his father told, uh, which his mother told him. I'm sorry. So you have this wonderful treatise on a godly woman taught by a mother to a guy who writes it into a book. And these are some sayings. What we know for sure is this appears to be written in Aramaic, so it's written later. So the second part of 31 appears to be much later. So when you're getting a final form, it's probably put together, I'm going to say, at the time of Ezra. So look where this went. This went from Solomon all the way to Ezra before it got to you, and then it went through putting it in chapters and verses. So it's come through some some modifications that have been helpful because now it's easy for us to turn to. All right. I don't need to go through authorship because I think you see that at the bottom. I do think that when you read Proverbs 22, 17, it says these are the sayings of the wise. You read Proverbs 24, 23, it says these are the sayings of the wise. You, you read some like ch uh, chapter 30 that says um, this is attributed to Agor, son of Yake. You can see there's a variety of authors. That's sufficient for your, your notes. <coughs> Because the book is not promises, but rather truisms of how life is supposed to work, how does it help you? I think that knowing how something is supposed to work is helpful. If you do any kind of work on your car, it's helpful to actually know how the part is supposed to work. That will help you to assemble it properly. Let me put it this way. If you know how life is supposed to work, you'll know how to assemble it properly. You'll have some idea. The big idea of the book is this. And this should go on the front sheet of your Proverbs book in your Bible. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That is, all thinking about how life should work is organized under how God said it's supposed to go. When I reverence God, when He's more important, His view of it is the true view of it, I step back and go, that's the organizational structure for all of my life. Not... What do a preponderance of Americans think it should be? So the definitions of everything then come from who God says. Now, how do I study this book? I mean, you're reading along and there's something on wisdom, then there's something on children, then there's something on truth, then there's something on money, then there's something on drink, then there's something on your heart, then there's something on pride, then it's back to wisdom, and you're going, what am I doing? This is, you, you literally will just be watching it like a ping pong match. Here's what I found has worked for me. I begin with a stack of colored pencils. And I start with one color, and I don't know how many of those pencils I'm going to use. And I color, let's say it's on wisdom. I color wisdom in my first color until I realize, oops, he's not talking about wisdom now. Now it's a proverb on money. So I take out green because, you know, money. And then I'll put that in there and I'll do that. And I'll go, oh, now he's not talking about money. He's talking about health. So I'll take out something else. And, I'll, and what I do is I color code so that all of the text is colored by its subject material. Then if someone says to me, hey, I'd like you to do a study on Proverbs, I'm not doing a study on a book. I'm doing a study on an array of subjects. And they're already color coded. I will tell you that after years of working through my Bible to the point where you literally the pages fell out, the only thing I know you can do to make sense of this book is to divide it up into its various subjects. Now, later on this year, some of you are going to have the assignment, well, all of you will have the assignment, some of you will complete it, of, of actually color coding the whole book. Well, is that about, is that about Wisdom or is that about knowledge? Or should I separate wisdom or should I keep wisdom and knowledge the same? It's entirely up to you. It's your Bible. The more specificity you give to your color coding, the more you'll be able to pull it apart 
And the more you can pull it apart, the deeper you can go into the narrative. So what I'd like to do is just mention some of the subjects that I divided mine into as I've looked at it. And I'm, not, I'm just going to throw out some subjects to you just so you get an idea of some of the subjects that are in the orbit of the book. Then I'm going to pick one and do a study. So we actually you know, study something that has spiritual benefit for you rather than just the mechanics of the book. Okay? So I picked out that the book does talk a great deal about wisdom. It talks about children. It talks about the fear of the Lord. It talks about the godly man. I got pages of the godly man. It talks about riches. It talks about a godly woman. Um, there are pages of that too, but it was less you know, applicable to me personally. So, I mean, but you want to know what one is, especially before you pick one. Um, there, there's a bunch of statements on truth, a good bit on business, a good bit on things like your heart or pride or your tongue. One of my favorites was to pick out all the statements of the fool. Now, I know that sounds cruel, but there's a reason. Biblically speaking, a fool is someone who tries to look at life disconnected from God. The word idiotes, idiot, is the word disconnected from reality. If the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge, if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom, if all things you can know are organized under reverence for God, then if you come out and say there is no God, you don't know why you're here, how you got here, where you're going, or what you're for. But other than that, you, you know, could know a lot. In other words, I was looking for the person disconnected from reality, and I found that when you disconnect the fear of the Lord from learning, you can take it in all kinds of directions, and it ends up with a lot of unintended consequences. Let me pick one. Let me pick a subject, and I'm going to look at what God said about a healthy life. So let's take a few minutes, and I'm going to move you around a little bit in the pages of Proverbs and just take a few minutes and look at a study on a healthy life, God's prescription for a healthy and long life for a believer. Now, these are written for people who already have a fear of the Lord. If you don't have that, then you, you need to find God before you follow him. This is a follow God thing. But I found out that when I took all of the health prescriptions in the book of Proverbs, I came up with five things. All I did was color code it all, then I put them all the ones of the same color on the same page, sat and looked at them and said, what are these? And I came up with five things. Remember, class, that you can use the Bible to say what you want, but that's not teaching the Bible. When you say what it says, you're teaching it. When you say what the hottest book on the shelf in the Christian bookstore says by using verses, you're then teaching somebody's idea and filling it with verses. That's dangerous. Speak from the text itself. Now, go to chapter 3 of Proverbs, and you'll see in the beginning, My son, do not forget my teaching. Let your heart keep my commandments. This word for commandments, mitzvah, is a, a, mitzvah is a, a deed that you practice that is given by God that is a prescribed deed. For length of days, for years of life, and peace, shalom, that is the word for when things are as they should be, they will add to you. Do you see what he says in verse 1? He says, if I grasp the teaching, if I let my heart practice the teaching, if I don't waver from that, then life was designed that I would live longer and better. Now, does that mean if I keep God's word, I cannot be hit by a truck? No, this is a truism. You don't take three verses and that protects you from cancer. It doesn't work like that. But this, what he says is, if I will allow myself to walk in his word, health is one of the benefits. Let me say it this way. People who disconnect themselves from the truth of God's word will become sicker than the crowd of people that don't. That's what he's saying. Now, how do I do that? Well, that's what verse 3 is for, because verses 1 and 2 tell me to do it. Verse 3 tells me how. Do not let chesed, the word kindness, that's the word for steadfast love, do not let truth, emet, faithful action, leave you. In other words, make it real in your heart, be passionate about it, and constantly faithfully do it. Bind, 
The word koshar is actually the word to place in league or tie yourself to, bind them to your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. That's the word for record or memorize. So you will find chen, favor, grace. You will get good repute. Sechel is like insider discernment in the sight of God and man. Verse 4 says that if I will take the time to bind God's word to my life, live it out kindly, memorize it, put it into my heart and mind, that I will gain from it grace, and I'll gain from it insight and discernment both with God and with men. That's what he's talking about when he says a long and better life. You'll be able to figure out what life is about. You'll be able to look at life and figure out what's going on around you. Then it says, in that context, betach is the word trust or be boldly confident in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean or place weight on on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge, that's the word for concern yourself with your view of him. And he will make your paths yashar, smooth, straight, confident, sure. It literally says that if I will take and put my confidence in God's word over the confidence in a Facebook post, if I'll put it in God's word over my best anecdotal experience, if I'll trust him and put no weight on the other, I will actually come out of this with a straight, straighter and smoother path. Let me say it this way. Life is easier when you believe what God said. It's just plain tougher when you have to make it up by yourself. And you would be surprised at the incredible drama and complexity in the lives of people who have walked away from God. Let me say it all under this heading. The first of his five prescriptions is be careful to heed and live God's word. I don't think it's hard to see it. Verses 7 and 8 say don't be wise in your own eyes. Reverence the Lord. Turn away from evil. It will be healing. Refut is actually healing to your body and refreshment that's quenching to your bones. You want to be healthier? Walk with God. <laughs> Can I make the argument that if you will follow God, He will take you further than you could go without Him, make it better than you would have without Him, and do more with your life than you could have ever done without Him? I got to tell you, psychologists will tell you that you need to feel good about yourself. That's the secret to health. The Bible says that's not the secret to health. It's to believe that what God said is true and to walk in it and to act in it. So I want to know God's word. I want to learn it well. I want to trust it. I want to celebrate it. I want to practice it. I want it to bring peace to my heart and to my relationships. I want to put all my weight on God's word. I want to concern myself with crediting him for all the progress as I move forward. And I want to recognize the arrogance of foolishness and remove evil choices from my life. And if I'll do that, I can take my first step. Here's the second one. The second one is be sure to revere the Lord and walk in obedience to him. I'm getting this from Proverbs 9. And in chapter 9, in verses 10 through 12, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, 9, 10 through 12, and that knowledge of the Holy One is understanding, for by me your days will be multiplied in the years of your life and will be added to you. He says, if you want to live a longer and better life, you do it by beginning to understand that you walk with me, reverence for me. That's the beginning of wisdom. That's the beginning of knowledge. So if I revere the Lord and I walk in obedience to him, he says it's a better life for me. Flip over to chapter 10, and in chapter 10, verse 27, there's another proverb just like this. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. I know, I know, I know Billy Joel yelled that only the good die young. It's not true. The people who are following God often live longer. I have to tell you, after hearing and reading all the health warnings of the media consistently, uh, you might want to listen to this tongue-in-cheek observation someone wrote. It said, brace yourself. Somewhere they're plotting scare of the week. Air is polluted. Water is too. Fish that swim in it are not good for you. Fruit and vegetables, delicious, you say. Don't eat them. They're loaded with pesticide spray. Avoid dairy products, say no to red meat, cholesterol levels must go in retreat. 
The rays of the sun will certainly fret you. Stay in your house and the radon will get you. If you walk in the woods, you can really get sick. Lyme's disease is spread by a pin-sized tick. If one thing won't get you, another one will. But don't worry, be happy, because worry can kill. <laughs> Within the frame of following God's word, you let him be God. And the method that he uses in your life and the length of your life and the quality of your life is his business. But you trust him. Okay, let me give you a third one. The third one is, if I want to have health, I'm going back to chapter 3 this time. I want to pursue constant learning and seek the truth. Here's a tip. When you stop learning, you start dying. As long as you're learning, you're actually moving toward, if, you're, if you understand the beginning of life is the fear of the Lord, and you're trying to learn so that you might be better usable to Him, then you're progressing even if you can't get out of a chair. Verse 13 of chapter 3 says, How blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding, for its profit is better than profit of silver, its gain than fine gold. She's more precious than jewels. Nothing you desire compares with her. Long life is in her hand. It says long life is in her right hand, and you should think of that as her intended purposes. In her left hand are riches and honor. Those are the unintended consequences. In other words, if I will seek God, long life is my intended reason for wanting to walk rightly before God, but riches and honor come as an unintended consequence. One comedian said, the only way to keep your health is to eat what you don't want, drink what you don't like, and do what you'd rather not. And it does feel like that sometimes, right? Because the natural bend of fallen man is to the lazy, is to the self-defeating. Chapter 4, verse 10, says it this way, Hear, my son, accept my sayings, and the years of your life will be many. The Bible makes the argument that if you'll listen to what God says, you'll be safer. You'll be wiser. Wisdom helps when working with heavy equipment. I used to do rigging on top of a very large, uh, it was in a refinery, and here's what you don't really realize until you're way up high and strapped to a, an I-beam. When, when that big motor moves towards you, that's several thousand pounds, you instinctively put your hand out to push it back. Guess what? It blows right through your body. You're not that strong. You're not that big. And when you'll understand that only by following what God says are you that wise, you'll live longer if you'll take what he says to be serious. Look at verse 20 of chapter 4. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them, health to, those, uh, to all their body. Watch over your heart with all diligence diligence for from it flow the springs of life. I want, to, I want to say something to you, and I deliberately mean this. I hope it's an encouragement to you. Some years ago, Focus on the Family was led by Jim Dobson before the current uh, director. And Dobson commissioned a study with Focus on the Family and the staff to conduct a broad survey of all the existing research they could get their hands on concerning marital status. Follow me for a second. From a social perspective, he asked, is it a good thing to be married? Or is marriage just a piece of paper, as fam family cynics have suggested? What resulted was a 36-page summary of 72 research studies, mostly from secular universities, which clearly showed the advantage for the average person of being in one monogamous marriage. You can't believe this by re listening to the media today that it makes any difference at all, but listen to this. Comparing traditional populations, married couples and children with married birth parents to other populations, never married singles, cohabiting couples, separated divorced individuals, blended step families and others, across the number of variables, including income, physical and mental health, lifestyle habits, the report argued that marriage is a definite plus for both the adult spouses and the dependent children. Based on the articles and the spin-off broadcasts of the articles that inspired Sunday school teachers could legitimately say to, to teenagers this, did you know that 90% of cohabiting couples plan to get married someday, but 40% break up before they get there? 
Did, did you know that those who live together before they're married are nearly twice as likely to get a divorce after they're married? In fact, the longer the couple lives together before they get married, the more likely they will get a divorce, statistically speaking. Did, did you know that 84% of all documented child abuse occurs in single parent homes? 84%. Half of those occurred at the hands of boyfriends. So when people tell you marriage doesn't matter, it's just a piece of paper, they're not looking at the facts. They're playing from the emotions. D did you know that a pregnant woman is four times more likely to be beaten by her boyfriend than by her husband? Four times. Even therapists gaining leverage from the report would encourage couples to stay together. Some people will tell you divorce is the answer, that, that it's a brief crisis and your kids will get over it. Listen to me very carefully. The research suggests that children of divorce are far more likely to end up adults with poorer incomes, weaker emotional adjustments, and less stable marriages. Now here's what I didn't say. If you came from a broken home, you're doomed. I didn't say that. What I said is, People are out there making the argument because they came from it and made it that it's actually equal to those who didn't have to go through it. That's like saying, well, you know, we could just let you walk out or scale a wall to get out, which is harder. Here's the truth. The Bible says if you'll follow the pattern that God gave, it'll be easier for you to accomplish it. Now, that sounds right, right? Proverbs 12, 18 says the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 13, 17 says, a faithful envoy brings healing. You know, honestly, when you hang out with people who know God and encourage you, did you know that encouragement changes your health? Let me flip that over. How many of you know that hanging out with pessimists and discouraged people ruins your health? So let's go the converse, okay? <laughs> Chapter 16, Proverbs 16, 22, understanding is a fountain of life to the one who has it. 16, 22, fountain of life. The, I, I've said this to you before in class, and I need you to understand. If you will grab on to learning as a lifelong trait, get excited about learning new things, you're going to find that that's actually going to lighten your step. And you're going to find that it's going to actually be a fountain of life because there's always something new out there to learn. Everything you go through today will help prepare you better for tomorrow if you'll learn from it. Okay, let me give you a fourth one of my five. The fourth one is find what helps you to be peaceful, positive, and thankful in your heart and life. You want to live longer? The Bible says, Proverbs 14.30, a tranquil heart is life to the body, but passion is rottenness to the bones. Now, he doesn't mean if you're passionate about something, it's killing you. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about stress. The Bible says stress will kill you. The Bible says if you're all wound up inside all the time, something's really wrong, and you are tearing yourself up. That's what it says. Can I make the argument that watching the news can be dangerous to your psychological health? Since most of the news is negative in nature, if somebody's not careful, you can develop a very pessimistic view of human nature. You know why? Because last night in Tampa, most everybody got along, but you didn't hear that on the news. You only heard the ones who killed each other. The rest of them didn't do anything. Therefore, you didn't hear about them. So our eyes are trained in a fallen world to focus on the negative. Give me the dirt. I had a friend who had a problem with gossip. I used to tell him all the good stuff I wanted passed around. I'd say, let me tell you five things I really like about that person. I figured if you're going to use it, it must work both ways, right? The year is 2065. An astronaut has been stranded in a space station for three years. One day, the astronaut receives a reply to his SOS calls. The captain of a nearby shuttle was dispatched as a ref rescue craft to the space station. The, the rescue vehicle docked with the space station. The officer in charge said to the stranded astronaut the following. Captain sends his compliments, sir. Also, these newspapers. These are all the newspapers of the world for the last three years. Kindly read them and then decide whether or not you want to be rescued. See, the problem is we literally have become so trained to hear the dirt that the dirt is what we think is the news. It's not. It's only... And now, an hour of what went wrong. 
And if we don't have enough of that, an hour of what we think might go wrong. Because there's a storm coming. When is there not a storm in storm season coming? Chapter 15, verse 30 says, good news puts fat on the bones. See, that's my problem. I hang out with good news, and that's my issue, OK? 1624 says, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, healing to the bones. I want to say something to you. Some of you are not going to agree with it. It's really OK with me. I checked it out very carefully. The AMA doctors have found that almost 70% of human illnesses are, in fact, psychosomatic. A disorder that involves the mind and body is a psychosomatic illness. It doesn't mean it's not real. It means it didn't start with the illness. It started with the stress. It started with how you felt. Psychosomatic illnesses are not imaginary. They're physical disorders that come from emotional thought patterns. In other words, we're thinking ourselves to death in this country with a lot of thoughts that are killing us. And we can't get enough. We're addicted. We have a 24-hour breaking news. <laughs> Let me tell you what else is going to go wrong as if enough hasn't gone wrong already. Proverbs 16, 26, a worker's appetite works for him, but his hunger urges him on. I love that God says it's all right. It's all right that you want to, to, to work harder. It's all right that you recognize that you can get a bigger chariot or a nicer camel if you'll work a little longer. I, that's okay. There's a story that Max Licato wrote some time ago, and I, I'm almost over, so I just want to share with you this story. The hallway is silent now, except for two wheels of the mop bucket and the shuffle of the old man's feet. Both sound tired. Both know these floors. How many nights has Hank cleaned them? Always careful to get in the corners, always careful to set up yellow caution signs on the wet floors, laughing to himself, be careful everyone, he chuckles to himself, since it's 3 a.m. and nobody's coming. Gout keeps him up at night. Arthritis makes him limp. His glasses are so thick his eyeballs now look twice as their size. His shoulders stoop. Slopping soapy water on the linoleum, scrubbing the heel marks left by the well-heeled lawyers. He'll be finished an hour before quitting time. He always finishes early. He has for 20 years. When he finishes, he'll put away the mop bucket and take a seat outside the office of the senior partner in wait. Never leaves early. He could. He could. No one would know, but he doesn't. He broke the rules once. Never again. Sometimes, if the door is open, he'll enter the office. Not for long, just to look. The suite is larger than his apartment. He'll run his finger over the desk. He'll stroke the soft leather couch. He'll stand at the window and watch the gray sky turn into gold. He'll remember. You see, he once had an office. Back when Hank was Henry. Back when the custodian was an executive, long ago, before the night shift, before the mop bucket, before the maintenance uniform, before the scandal. Hank doesn't think about it much anymore. There's no reason to. He got in trouble, he got fired, and he got out. That's it. Not many people know about it. It's better that way. It's his secret. Hank's story, by the way, is true. I've changed a detail or two and put him in a different century, but the story is in fact factual. It was a mistake in Hank's case, but it was one he could never forget. A grave mistake. Hank killed someone. He came upon a thug beating an innocent man, and Hank lost control, and he killed the mugger. When word got out, Hank got out. He would rather hide than go to jail. So he ran. The executive became a fugitive. It's a true story and a generally a common one. Although the details are not as extreme as Hank's, he was trained in the finest institutions of the world, yet working the night shift at a minimum wage job so he wouldn't have to see the light of day. But all of that changed the day when he heard the voice from the mop bucket. At first he thought, the voice was a joke. Some of the fellows on the third floor were playing some kind of trick. Henry, Henry, the voice called. Hank turned. No one called him Henry anymore. 
Henry! Henry! He turned toward the pail. It was glowing, bright red, hot red. He could feel the heat 10 feet away. He stepped closer and looked in. The water wasn't boiling. Well, that's strange, he thought. He mumbled to himself as he took another step to get closer. But the voice stopped him. Don't come any closer. Take off your shoes. My shoes? Take off your shoes. That's a holy tile. Suddenly, Hank knew who was speaking. God, I'm not making this up. I know that you think I am. Sounds crazy. Almost irreverent. God speaking from a hot mop bucket to a janitor named Hank? Would it be more believable if I turned it into a bush and called him Moses? The story reminds you of something. The story was designed to say something, and I think Lucado did it. God doesn't choose you because you're smart. God doesn't choose you because you're better than other people. God decides he's going to work with you when you decide you're going to follow him. Last one before we go. Proverbs 18, 14, the fifth prescription is have the courage to believe that God's at work. And that's why I read that story. Have the courage to believe that it's God doing something. Listen to these words from Proverbs 18, 14. The spirit, the ruach of a man can endure his sickness, but as for a broken spirit, who can bear it? The Bible says that if your spirit is broken, your body will follow. That's essentially what Proverbs 18 says. I want to close this by saying that one of the greatest evangelistic hymns of all time was written by a woman, and the hymn is called Just As I Am, and I would bet that most all of you know it. It's frequently sung in evangelistic meetings. It was written by Charlotte Elliott. She was at one time incredibly bitter with God about her circumstances in life. She was an invalid from her youth. And she deeply resented the constraints of her handicap and, 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 and it didn't allow her to participate in the activities she wanted to participate in. And in an emotional outburst on one occasion, she expressed those feelings to a doctor, uh, Dr. Cesar Milan, uh, who was a minister visiting from uh, in her home. And, he, and, and the, the pastor listened. He was touched by her distress. He insisted that her problems would not divert her attention, but that she should listen to what God was trying to say to her. He called on her, give your heart to Jesus. Give your heart, follow him. She resented what seemed like a callous attitude. But God spoke through that man. and She committed her heart to Jesus. Each year on the anniversary of that decision, Dr. Milan wrote to Charlotte a letter encouraging her to continue to be strong in her faith. But even as a Christian, she had doubts and she had struggles. Her body hurt. One, particularly sore point, one particular sore point was that her inability to effectively go out and serve the Lord. She just felt like, why does God want me? I can't do anything. This body doesn't work. At times, she resented her brother's successful preaching and evangelistic career. She, she longed to be used of God herself. It's interesting. Then in 1836, on the 14th anniversary of her conversion... While she was alone one evening, the 47-year-old Charlotte Elliott wrote the spiritual autobiography in verse, Just As I Am. Here in the prayer of confession, she poured out her feelings. She said to the Lord, Wow, so many others have so much more than I. Listen to the third stanza of Just As I Am, because it really talks about her pilgrimage. Just as I am, though tossed about, with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Many years later, when reflecting on the, wife, uh, the life of his sister, Reverend Henry Van Elliot, the brother who was the preacher, said, you know, in the course of my long ministry, I hope I've been permitted to see some fruits of my labors. But I have to tell you, I feel I will never have done as much as my sister's simple song. A broken body, but a big ministry. When you talk about health, and you start with the fear of the Lord, and you follow what the Lord does, He'll take you further and do more through you than you can do, 
even if you're healthy, even if you're strong, even if you're rich, even if you're so full of yourself. In fact, in the Bible, bankruptcy, the definition of bankruptcy is a person full of themselves. The definition of riches is a person delighting in their Lord. Proverbs is a series of statements that are help, to help you understand how the world was intended to be. But it rests upon one statement, and without that statement, it won't work. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's the way it was designed. 